Uh, thank you for joining me this evening. My name is Nick, and I am a membership clerk with DoSpace. Um, I do a lot of work with um, different sorts of digital media. I do, I pretty much do it all, uh, from photography to uh, uh, digital rendering with, you know, the stuff that Pixar kind of does. Um, I see all kinds of different stuff with that. But uh, this evening, we are going to talk about phone photography, how you can do... Uh, how you can take better pictures with your phone without knowing too much about the camera stuff. Photography is a really complex and uh, difficult to approach sort of topic at some points, but um, don't worry, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna dive too deep into that this evening. More so, we're gonna focus on some things that you can be using to uh, increase the quality of your photographs. So let's go ahead and dive right on in. So here's what we're going to be going over this evening. Uh, we're going to be going over something called the rule of thirds and lighting patterns. These two in conjunction can make some crazy pictures. I mean, seriously, this one's going to help you align stuff in your photograph, and this one's going to, well, help you how to light it. And something I want to stress before we get too far is that good photography does not come from having a good camera. Now, yes, technically speaking, having a better, higher quality camera will get you a higher quality photograph. However, just because the photograph is high quality doesn't necessarily mean it's a good photo. By using some of the things we're going to talk about today, you can really change the overall aesthetic. Aesthetic is a good word for it. You can change the overall aesthetic of your photographs to make them look a lot more appealing to the eye. Now, this can be applied to pretty much any camera, not just your phone. I mean, like, if you have, like, a five-year-old uh, digital camera, you can use it with that if you want to. Um, but uh, it's not just for phones. This works pretty much universally. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive right on into the rule of thirds. If you haven't heard of the rule of thirds, don't worry about it. Um, basically, what the rule of thirds is, is it's a small or not small, sorry. It's a golden, a golden principle in photography that helps us align things in our photographs. So it looks kind of like this little tic-tac-toe board here. Imagine this, but uh, sort of overlaid on top of your photographs. And what people do is they align things in their photographs to these points. So to this line or to this, uh, this line or this intersection point. And the reason why this works is because it forces us to move things around in our photo in a way that makes it look more appealing. It adds what we call flow. It may, lets your eye move through the picture a lot easier. Uh, I am, uh, I, by the way, if you do have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. I will be doing my best to keep an eye on that. Um, and if you do want to watch this later, we will be recording this and throwing it up on our YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel there. Um, so if you need me to go over some stuff, feel free to ask, but this will be able, you'll be able to watch this again later. Anyway, so uh, as a sort of demonstration of what the rule of thirds can do for your photography, it's going to look a little something kind of like this. On the left here, we have a photograph that I took um, without the rule of thirds, and you know, it doesn't look too shabby, it's not too bad, but then you look at the one over on the right here, and all of a sudden, this one, it just looks more balanced, your eye sort of moves through it a lot easier, and it just looks a lot more professional, in my opinion. Um, and don't worry, I'm going to explain all the different ways you can use the rule of thirds to achieve effects kind of like this, and the reason why this works and this doesn't work. So how can you use the rule of thirds? Well, um, first and foremost, you actually have the benefit of being able to turn it on on your phone. For most phones, if it's iPhone or Android, if you go up into the top, I believe it's top left corner, there should be a gear there. If you go ahead and tap on that gear, that'll take you to the settings for your camera. Now, if you scroll down in your settings and find something that says use grid, um, and then turn that on, once you go back into the camera, there should be an overlay for, uh, your, uh, for the rule of thirds on your phone. And you can start using that to uh, align your camera to things. Once you've done that, uh, you can, uh, you'll want to, as I mentioned, you want to align objects to the lines and intersection points on your phone. So don't worry, I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment here. But another piece of advice that I have is try to avoid having the main subject of your photograph in the center of the photo. 
sometimes this works and makes things look okay, but oftentimes I think that when you have things offset by using the rule of thirds, it can make things look a lot more interesting. A good example of this is if you ever look at interviewers or like an interview video, people aren't in the exact center of the video. They're a little bit off to the side. And this is because it makes you look, it forces your eye to go like right to them, whether it's on the left side or right side of the screen. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it doesn't always work out. It's really up to the, the beauty, beauty in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. If uh, you think it looks good in the center, take a photograph of it and then maybe try it in a different way. That's one of the biggest things about photography is you can always take another shot unless you don't have any space, but that's very rarely the case. So we're gonna go ahead and get into the actual specifics of what you can use each line for in the rule of thirds, uh, starting with the horizontal lines. Now the horizontal lines, are great for horizon or widespread shots. So in this case, uh, what I did was I went out on an evening uh, where it wasn't too, uh, too cloudy, just a little cloudy, and uh, I waited for the sun to get low, and I decided, you know what, that is a beautiful shot. I wanna go ahead and get that captured. So what I did was I had that overlay for the rule of thirds turned on, and I aligned it with uh, the bottom line here in the rule of thirds. I aligned the horizon, sorry, with the uh, bottom line in our rule of thirds. So what this does by using these bottom line is it controls how much of each sort of thing, so to speak, we have in our photo. It creates what we call balance. If you were to look at this uh, and answer, answer a question for me, how much, uh, what takes up majority of the photo? If you said sky, you'd be right. You see, by using this line, I have controlled what takes dominance over in our photograph. In this case, it's the sky. There's a lot more going on up here than there is going on down here. And that's what the rule of thirds does. It helps us proportion and space things out in a way that makes them look appealing. It balances things out. It makes things just, it just makes things look better. <laughs> Um, now, in the case of the horizontal lines, this is great for like anything that we're any shot you're trying to take when you're trying to align it to the horizon. So uh, let's say, since this is Nebraska, let's say you're out in the field, so to speak, and the sun's going down and it looks real pretty, and uh, you just you got you gotta have that shot. What you want to do is you want to take this line or even this line, align it to the horizon and you're gonna have yourself a beautiful shot every single time. I can think of very few instances where this has failed me. <laughs> um, now, the reason why I also mentioned this line up here is because this line can be used to make it so that the majority of what's in your photo is the ground. If there's some sort of thing going on in the, on the ground that you want to have, then you could align this line up here to the horizon so that our eye focuses on whatever is going on down here rather than in the sky. And you can do this all the live long day. I mean, there's a billion different applications you can use just for these horizontal lines. Um, another good one I can think of is if you're uh, taking like a group photo, try and align uh, the top line to the top of the head of the tallest person. That's a really good way to make it so that, you know, you're... Uh, everything is sort of spaced out evenly and there's an even amount of space above everybody, so to speak. I mean, obviously if they're shorter, there's gonna be more space, but it's a good way to sort of, again, balance things out, control what takes predominance over the photograph. Now we're gonna move on to uh, the, next, the next part. We're gonna move on to the, uh, the vertical lines. These can be a bit, these are interesting. So in this shot, um, we're doing the same thing all over again. We're, we're balancing out what takes, uh, we're, sorry, not balancing, we're uh, figuring out what takes the dominant, what's dominant in our photograph. This time around, it's this building. Uh, it takes up at least, it takes up these six rectangles here rather than uh, just these three over here. Now, what's interesting about this one is that it kind of looks like things are, almost split equally if you ignore the rule of thirds here. And that's what I'm trying to say is sometimes uh, it's good to have things in the absolute center of your photograph. 
Uh, sometimes it works out, but sometimes it doesn't. Now, in the specific case, though, for these vertical lines, I think it's really good to align the vertical lines with things that are tall in your shot. So uh, a good example I can think of besides this is, again, uh, maybe you've got a shot of someone standing in front of a sunset. You want to align this tall line here with that person. Um, another good thing it is these lines are good for where uh, as these, the, vertical, the horizontal lines are good for balancing things uh, from the top to the bottom, the vertical lines are good for uh, balancing things from left to right. So what you can do with this is you can create photographs where there's nothing going on over here and then a lot going on over here, which is what I've done with this photograph here. Um, I'm gonna be really honest, I find a lot more use with the ver with the uh, the horizontal lines than I do the vertical lines, but they definitely do have their uses. I just I think I'm just a big fan of the uh, the wide wide horizon shots. I think I just who doesn't like a sunset, right? Come on. <laughs> so we're gonna move on from this guy to the next thing you can do with the rule of thirds, which is the intersection points. Now I've positioned my uh, marionette friend here. Don't worry, you'll be seeing him plenty throughout this thing. Um, and what I've done here is I've aligned this point here with his shoulder. Now this creates what we call a focal point. A focal point is something that your eye is drawn to in a photograph, or painting, or any, any, any sort of media, visual media. Your eye gets drawn into these focal points. Um, now, I would say for, for a photograph's sake, this isn't a very interesting one, but it is a good example of aligning something to this, this point here. Now, generally speaking, you want to use these, uh, these intersection points and you want to align them to things that are interesting in your photograph. So um, things like uh, if you're taking a photo, let's say, let's say it's a birthday party, right? And uh, little Sally is turning five years old. What you want to do if she's, uh, you know, blowing out the candles on her cake and you've got your phone out trying to get a nice picture, Try and align this intersection point with the middle of her face. This is a technique that's used by professionals all over the world, and even in cinematography too. They use these intersection points on people's faces because it makes the face a point of interest, and it's where your eye is going to go uh, when, uh, when they look at the photograph. Uh, if you've got sort of a more close-up photograph of a person's face, though, uh, try aligning the, the intersection points with their eyes. Um, this will, again, make your eye focus on their eyes. Uh, we tend to look a lot at people's eyes. They say a lot about people, uh, but that's, that's more of a philosophy thing than anything else. So, <laughs> so here's where the real magic comes in. We, we've talked about how to use each of these things individually. So what if we want to use uh, more of them all together? This is an excellent... Um, this is an excellent point, and actually what I would recommend. See, sometimes using one is good, but using many can get you tons of different results. So the next example I have should look familiar. Remember this guy? <laughs> so here's what's going on with this photograph. The reason why it looks so good is because it doesn't only use an intersection point, but it also creates a horizon with the table. See, I would like to use at least one intersection point and one, uh, one, one sort of line in my photographs, one, one of the either vertical or horizontal lines in the photographs um, that I take, because I think it generally spurs out some very interesting results. It's not always, you know, it's not foolproof. It doesn't work every time, but it is a good thing to try. Let's see, I've got some stuff in the chat here. Uh, Miss, I apologize if I mispronounce this, Miss Lorraine. Does the rule of, does the rule change much depending on if your camera is vertical or horizontal? Uh, obviously. Ah, yes. So here's the interesting thing about uh, changing the orientation of your, uh, of your camera with this. You see, if I was to take this and actually turn it, um, the rule, it would rotate with you. And truth be told, I think it still works relatively well if you uh, turn it vertical. It just, uh, it becomes a lot, the, uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't use, uh, 
I don't use it in a vertical mode very much. I like my horizontal. But uh, the rule should still apply and work seamlessly if you have it uh, in, a, uh, in a vertical, if you're holding your phone vertically. Now, you just got to be careful. Uh, it's going to be flipped then. So these lines here are going to be your uh, vertical lines. Sorry, these lines here are going to be your horizontal lines. And then these will be your vertical. So you want to watch out for that. Uh, I see one more in here. Does the rule change much depending on your camera? Oh, it's the, my bad. <laughs> my apologies. Of course, no problem. So back to this thing though. So what we see that uh, we've got a point of in, the intersection point here at the, uh, in the, in the barrel of the camera there. Now here's an interesting thing that you can do if you're not taking photographs of faces and you're trying to take a photograph of a thing. Try and align these intersection points with an area that is darker than the rest of the photo or maybe even brighter. So what this does is because since this is the darkest point in our photo, our eye is going to be naturally driven to that because it sticks out. Well, what you can do with that is by aligning a uh, intersection point here, it not only makes a focal point, but it's like an amplified vocal point because it also has an interesting difference in color from the rest of the photograph. So we've seen what it, what it would look like to use a, uh, a horizontal line in tandem with a intersection point. So what about um, using it the other way around? What if we have a, uh, a vertical line and intersection point? What, what does that look like? Well, I believe I've got one more in here. Yes, if we have any, if we have any Doctor Who fans in here uh, this evening, you're in for a treat. If not, don't worry about it. I'm just a big old nerd. <laughs> anyway, so here I've got a, a, a little character here, and the intersection point is now uh, on what I guess we could call his eye. But again, that's not the only thing that's been aligned to a feature in our photograph here, because now we've got this vertical line here that aligns sort of with the middle of our, uh, of our little fella here. And this does that thing that I was mentioning earlier with our, uh, our horizontal, or sorry, our vertical lines, where we've got a, a widespread area, but we've got something that's sort of like sticking up out of it. This is a good example of what you'd want to do then. And even if you look here still, it still looks like the, uh, the horizontal line here is still sort of aligned to the, uh, the back of the table here. So it's still sort of creates a, uh, a a horizon effect, but it, not so much since it's not really the emphasis. It kind of does. I guess it does, but more so to the point, back to our character here, what we want to do, or what you would want to do in instances like this where you've got a wide area and, an, and a feature is you'd want to try and align uh, the vertical line to it and then find an area on it uh, where you could align the intersection point to it. Now, if there isn't, I wouldn't sweat it, but um, sometimes it's not going to happen. Like if I was to go back there earlier with the, uh, the picture of, the, of that building there, the building was just too tall from where I was standing. If I had backed up, maybe we, we could have found another way, but I honestly felt like that was uh, a little bit more of an interesting composition than uh, anything else. Um, so to summarize what you can do with the rule of thirds is basically if you use the rule of thirds to move things around in your photograph or move your camera around, you can position things in a way that looks a lot more appealing than uh, otherwise. Now, as I mentioned, it's not bulletproof. It doesn't always work. And sometimes you can get uh, results that look better without it, but it does certainly help to try and use it every, uh, it does help try to use it at least a little bit sometimes. Uh, so before we move on too far here, I am going to go ahead and take this moment to take any questions in the chat here uh, in case I need to re go over some stuff or answer some questions or anything like that. Um, you can post that in our chat here and I will uh, do my best to keep up with that. Did, uh, did we have any questions thus far? Um, if uh, this is again from uh, Ms. Hall, uh, do you uh, ever get to a point where you don't need the lines? Ah, that is an interesting point of conversation. So in, I don't want to say in the old days, but a while before um, we had the ability to actually just display this over our camera screen, um, we, uh, you actually had to imagine them yourself 
<laughs> which would be, you know, relatively difficult. So some professionals out there actually don't need the lines because they can imagine them in their head. I'd say if you use it a lot, eventually you'll get to the point where you can just turn them off and then uh, you can just sort of imagine it yourself because, you know, you've used it so many times. I myself, I just like having it on there because I think it's a great re it's a reassurance for me and, you know, I'm, I'm still getting used to it myself, uh, but, uh, you know, eventually, yes, there is a point when you don't actually need them anymore. Anyway, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next uh, topic of discussion for this evening, which is going to be lighting patterns. Now, originally I had planned to sort of discuss uh, the very basics of lighting, but lighting is a lighting is everything. Let's just put it that way. When it comes to any visual media, uh, lighting is a factor. Now, without delving too deep into the concept of what lighting is. Um, lighting patterns are what we can use. Sorry, I need, forgot to push the button there. Uh, a lighting pattern is what we can use to position the light around our subject. And overall, what it does is it changes the way they're lit. And because it has changed the way that they're lit, it changes the way we sort of feel about the photograph. It, it gives, you know, sometimes photographs can be lit in a way that looks really casual and laid back. Other times they're, you know, darkly lit and it looks sort of scary and intense and, you know, super dramatic. You see that kind of stuff on like movie posters and stuff like that. So that's, that's what changing the position of your light is. And some of these positions are referred to as certain patterns. So, I've got a little graphic here, a little silly graphic. Um, imagine here from a bird's eye view, uh, this is your subject, happy and smiley. And over here is your camera. And each of these suns can represent a different position uh, of your light. So here the light would be directly on him, or over here the light would kind of be on his side, or again over here it could be, again, on his side. Each of these different positions creates what we call a light pattern. Now, there are literally hundreds of light patterns out there, maybe. I, I don't know how many there are exactly, but I do know that there are five basic ones. And that is what we're going to talk about this evening. We're going to talk about the, the five basic lighting patterns. We've got flat lighting, paramount lighting, loop, Rembrandt, and split. So um, we're going to just, we're just going to go ahead and dive right into it. So flat lighting, flat lighting is sort of the lighting comes directly from the camera. It's right on the subject. Not obviously, you know, directly in their face. <laughs> that would, that'd be pretty unpleasant, but it is directly on them. Think of like a camera flash. Uh, whenever you take a picture and it flashes right on the object, that would be what flat lighting looks like. Um, there's barely any amount of shadow and, um, oh, I, I forgot to mention. So the main amount, the main source of light in your photograph is what we call a key light. The key light, when you see key light, think main light. It's the, uh, it's the thing that makes the most light in your photograph. So if you're outside, uh, your key light is going to be the sun. Or maybe if you're inside, uh, your key light can be the ceiling light. It all comes down to what light you use. But we're going to get to that topic of discussion a little bit later. We've got a little ways to go. Back to flat, oops, sorry, back to flat lighting. The key light, as I mentioned, is right in there, uh, right, right flat against the subject. And this lighting is really popular with TV shows like uh, 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 The Office. I know The Office is very, they use a lot of flat lighting in The Office. Um, the Big Bang Theory, they use it. Uh, any news broadcast, the flat lighting, flat lighting is used with them as well. Um, and it's going to look a little something like this. Um, told you my marionette friend would come back. <laughs> there he is. So as you can see, the light is literally right on my subject here. There isn't very many shadows on him. And when I say shadows, I mean there isn't very many uh, shadows like physically on him. There's always going to be shadow. Where there is light, there is shadow. And there will always be shadows behind him, but we're more focused on the actual shadows on him. How much of him can we actually see based on the current lighting? And with flat lighting, you can pretty much see everything. 
So now we're going to move on to the next one. And before I get too far from flat lighting, I just wanted to say that it's a very casual lighting style. Not really my sort of thing. I get kind of bored with flat lighting, but it is it does have its purposes. Things like portraits are great for flat lighting. But another good thing, uh, another thing that can be used for portraits is what we call paramount lighting or butterfly lighting. Uh, so what we've done now is we have taken our main light and we have moved it up slightly. Now, it's very important that you don't move the light up too much. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of shadow and you'll get what we call, uh, if you have a person, you're going to get what we call, um, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, raccoon, raccoon lighting, where the, uh, your eyes are completely shaded and you, you can't see, you know, you, you can't see their eyes. Um, if, uh, if you're going for like a horror movie thing, that's great. That, Perfect. Uh, if not, though, uh, you just need to lower that light a little bit for me. <laughs> and the reason why it's sometimes called butterfly lighting is because when the, when the light is positioned above us, it makes a, the shape of a butterfly, or it makes a shadow that is the shape of a butterfly underneath our nose. Although it also gets its name Paramount Lighting because the uh, the studio, Paramount Studios, you know, the, the guys who make... Uh, uh, <laughs> the guys who make Transformers, Ninja Turtles, I'm, I'm not very up to date. I know they've made a lot of other stuff, but those are just two examples I can think of. Uh, back in the day, back in the early days of Hollywood, they would use Paramount lighting uh, with their female actresses to highlight the, uh, the, their facial features. Um, nowadays, it, it's used for a lot of different things. Um, it's really sort of uh, stemmed out and has been used for a lot of different things. Um, and this is going to be the first style in our list that adds some slight shadows, as you probably guessed by this point. And it's going to look a little bit like this. So if we were to go back to flat lighting for just a moment, that would be what flat lighting looks like, you know, very, very few, if any, shadows at whatsoever. And then we, boom, we've got butterfly lighting, where suddenly we've got little bits of shadows underneath the, uh, the chest here. Um, we can see some shadows uh, underneath the ribs. We can we got some shadow underneath the uh, the face there. I like this lighting style because I think it looks really good for things like uh, portraits and um, honestly, I honestly it's just killer when it comes to portraits. Um, I think it makes a very beautiful even light style. It brings out some slight shadows, but it's not overly dramatic. It's still sort of got a casual feel to it. That way you don't feel overwhelmed with, uh, you know, uh, shadow, I guess we should say. Um, don't worry, later on we are going to, you'll see what I mean by an overwhelming amount of shadow. Uh, now we're going to get to our, our mid-ground here, which is going to be loop lighting. Loop lighting is interesting because it's very similar to butterfly or paramount lighting because the light is still above us. However, it's now been moved to a 45 degree angle. So imagine, if you will, uh, from a bird's eye view, our subject is here, right? So the light was here for loop lighting, and now it's just been moved over here. So it creates this uh, 45 degree angle from our subject. What you can do with this, or what it does per se, is it casts more of a shadow to one side of our subject here. And an interesting thing that it does, kind of like butterfly lighting, is it will cast what we call a loop-looking sort of shadow to the side of the nose. Uh, and it's going to look a little bit more like this. Um, now, compar comparatively to butterfly lighting, uh, it's added a lot more shadow here. Definitely a dark side is running, or there are dark spots running along the side of our, uh, of our marionette friend here. They're not too dramatic, though. They're not too crazy. But it is starting to grow. I think this is a great mid-ground for uh, dramatic versus casual lighting. Uh, if you're trying to make your photo look super serious, but not too serious, you know? Like, um, let's, say, let's say you're taking a photograph of an important individual who represents a lot of things. I think this is a great lighting for that because it will cast a certain respectable amount of shadow to make them look like an authoritative figure, but also at the same time, not too much to make them look unfriendly or uh, dramatic and, you know, stoic, so to speak. Um, let's see here. Oh, I've got some stuff in the chat here. Uh, 
I have a Samsung Note 8. Is there a place on my phone that shows the different lightings you are talking about? I, I actually, I don't know for sure. Um, you see, the thing is, is these lightings are sort of, they're not something that can be emulated by the phone, unfortunately. Um, this is all, this is all factors that happen outside of the phone. The phone just acts as a camera instead of a, uh, hmm. I don't know for sure, actually. You may, you may want to go online and look for that one. I, uh, I would not be too sure about that. Good question, though. Very good question. Uh, okay, so we were on loop lighting. Uh, the next lighting that we've got here is Rembrandt lighting. Now, Rembrandt lighting is probably one of my favorites because it's probably the more dramatic. Uh, it's when we really start to get into the more dramatic looking light styles. So uh, we've still got the light above our subject, and, um, but what we've done now is instead of having it at a 45 degree angle, so again, imagining our subject from a bird's eye view from top down, uh, the light was here, but now it can be anywhere from here to here, but it can't be at 90 because we'll talk about what a 90 degree lighting angle looks like uh, very soon here. <laughs> But um, we've done now, what we've done now is we've essentially increased the amount of shadow on one side of the subject. So now it almost looks like they're, you know, I want to say almost half shaded, but that wouldn't be correct. <laughs> uh, I, let's say they're a quarter. I think an interesting thing on people, what this does or onto the cheek, onto like their cheek over here instead of over here. So if the light is here. There's going to be a lot more light on the per on our on our subject here, but there'll be that strange triangle pattern on their cheek because the light will still go over their nose uh, to get to that side of them. Um, I would recommend uh, googling, by the way, each of these uh, in case the examples I've got here don't quite do it for you, um, just because these things can be sort of abstract and. Um, I would say the more examples you see of these things, the better, just so that you can get a little bit more acquainted with each style. Anyway, so th this is an example of what Rembrandt lighting would look like. Um, compared to our, uh, our loop lighting, there's still, you know, everything's still relatively bright here, but um, here things are a lot darker, a lot more, as I mentioned, dramatic or intense. Now we've got a lot of shadow coming in here on this side of his torso. On pretty much on the side of everything here. Um, so we've got a dark spot running along the arm here. Uh, even the other half of his face here is starting to get a little darker, and we still have that dark corner on his head. Uh, you can see what I mean by uh, using these styles. There is an extra amount of shadow making an extra amount of what I would call drama, or sometimes what is also referred to as depth. Uh, there's a lot more depth to these figures now because the lighting has added shadow to them. Uh, so that is what Rembrandt lighting would look like. Um, truth be told, I think it's uh, one of the, if you're taking a portrait photo of somebody, this is going to be probably one of the, uh, the, I won't say the most dramatic because that's coming up next year, but definitely a high contender for uh, cinematic looking phot photography. I bet you if you went out there and looked at some movie posters, you'll find some Rembrandt lighting on some of them. I guarantee it. But what you'll also find is our next pattern, referred to as split lighting. The light is now no longer above them, but is from a complete 90, it's coming from a 90 degree angle from them. So it comes from the side of our subject. Uh, what it does now is our subject is half lit, half shadowed, and it's, it makes this intense lighting where only one half of the thing is lit, uh, and one half of it is in darkness. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, so, as we can see now, uh, and as well as the rest of the scene too has changed quite a bit, the light is now only really hitting uh, the one side of each feature on our person here. So, one side of the arm is in light, one side of the arm is in dark, one side of the head is in light, and the other is in dark, and so on and so forth throughout the entire figure. This lighting style is great for making super dramatic photos. Uh, uh, this is actually a very popular lighting style with athletes, actually, uh, for athlete portraits. See, what they do is they choose this lighting style because uh, it uh, actually highlights their muscles. Uh, the light 
rolls across their uh, their muscles and stuff, and it highlights them because the muscles are round. And it, I don't know how to explain exactly how it works, but because of the way it highlights their muscles, split lighting is very popular when it comes to athletic portraits. So that's going to pretty much wrap it up for each of the different patterns. Again, again, I highly recommend going out onto Google and uh, Googling for some more examples of these guys because, uh, trust me, you're going to want a little bit more references than just my words here. <laughs> um, but if it's enough for you, awesome. I'm happy to help. Uh, so the big question is then I've outlined all of these styles here. How do we use them? How do we implement them? How can I use these lighting patterns? And well, we're going to go through each different thing here, each of these little items here and how you can use it with it. So let's say you want to be outside and you want to have a photograph that you want to take, um, but you want to use a certain light pattern. Well, I'm going to be honest with you right off the bat. Outside photography when using light patterns is going to put you at a little bit of a disadvantage because you're going to have to wait for the sun to get to the right position. Unless you've got a way to move the sun, in which case I'm terrified of you. But <laughs> uh, so basically um, what you'd want to do if you uh, have a certain light style in mind, a light pattern in mind, is you'd want to wait for the sun to get to the exact right angle uh, the exact angle that you're waiting for. So let's say you want some split lighting with the sun. Uh, what you'd want to do is you'd want to wait for sunrise, sunset, and then you'd want to take a photograph of your subject uh, with the sun hitting them from the side to get that split lighting. Now, because the sun is the biggest, brightest light that I can think of out there, it's it's going to bounce. Light doesn't just stop when it hits things. It bounces around, bounces around and goes all over the place. Uh, that's the physics of light, and I'm, I'm definitely not a uh, not a physics professor, but that's how light sort of. That's a very brief way of explaining how light works in physics: is that it, it doesn't just stop when it hits things; it bounces off. So you're gonna get it, you're not gonna get a perfect dark shadow if you're trying to do some split lighting with the sun. It's just it's just too bright, unfortunately. But it can be done in an interesting way. Now here's an interesting uh, concept. Because sometimes waiting for the sun can uh, be a little bit tedious, if you have the ability to, you should just move the subject. Now, as I mentioned before, you're gonna be at a disadvantage since you gotta wait for the sun and sometimes it can be really difficult to move things uh, around and in relation to the sun, but uh, it can be done, like let's say, um, Let's say you want some flat lighting with the sun. Uh, well, here, a good way to do that is to uh, wait till it's noon. And then if you want to, you could just uh, set your uh, item down in a field or in a flat area outside. And then just take your camera, point downwards, and then boom, you've got flat lighting. Because the light is coming from directly above and is still hitting your subject uh, and your camera's you know, facing the same direction as your light. Now, this can get a little bit more tricky with the other types of lighting uh, besides split and flat. Uh, you got to be careful because, again, the sun is just, a, it's, <laughs> it can be difficult to work with. I would recommend if you're going to be out and about uh, taking photographs outside, try taking them, uh, I would recommend use exercising the rule of thirds more at this point than anything else um, until until you work with these patterns a little bit more uh, on the in uh, like inside. Um, that would be my recommendation, just so that you can get a little bit more familiar with this stuff because it can get a little tricky when you're thinking about it. Now, now we're going to talk about doing trying and using this stuff inside. My personal favorite. I love working inside because it's where I can have the most control, and you can too. You see, when you're inside, you can have, uh, you don't need to wait for the sun. You can define, you can move your light sources around. You can change how it's all set up. And what I mean by that is, well, let me back up a step here. <laughs> so when you're inside, if you have a designated space to take these photographs and some designated lights for your photographs, you can customize that any way you want. Um, 
you don't have to, you know, there's, as I mentioned, there's no waiting for the sun. There's no moving around in abstract ways, although you can, if you want to make it interesting. Um, but something that you're going to want to do when you're taking photographs inside and you're trying to like set things up is you're going to want to create a studio. So here's what you got to do. You're going to want to find a room without any windows, if possible. If not possible, then what you want to do is you want to block out those windows um, to the best of your ability. So if you've got like curtains, um, blankets, uh, I at my apartment, I, uh, I have uh, a cardboard trifold <laughs> that I used to block out my window. It works okay, but uh, some light still gets out of the edges. So it's not perfect, but it works. Uh, and then once you've got all the light blocked out in your space, you'll want to uh, create an empty space for your uh, for where you're going to take these photographs. Um, make sure you've got plenty of space to walk around and move around. Uh, and then you'll want to uh, position and gather lights. Now, this is my favorite part of the whole process because... I don't know about you guys, but I uh, I do not have access to thousand uh, dollar lights. I don't have rigs that hang from my ceiling. I don't have any of that, not yet. But maybe in the future. So, what we do, what I do instead, is I look out and uh, search for interesting and new creative ways to make light. And a light source can come from uh, a light source can be rather anything that emits light. I've got a whole list here of different things, and I've used them all. I've used desk lamps, overhead lamps, so like ceiling lights, uh, holiday lights, so like Christmas lights that you put on a Christmas tree, display screens. Now, on a side note, display screens are some of my most favorite things when it comes to uh, um, diverse lighting solutions. Because what you can do with a display screen, and, and what I mean by a display screen is I mean like a phone screen, TV screen, a uh, computer monitor, Anything that is a screen, so to speak, uh, you can do this with. And what I mean by do this, you, what you can do is you can go and you can find, uh, just Google any color, literally any color. Then you can find that color, you can full screen that, and just like that, you've created yourself a blue light or an orange light or just a white light. I love this trick. I've actually used it in, this, uh, in our examples there with our marionette friend. Uh, that was actually lit with an iPad screen that was just blank white. Personally, that is one of my most favorite tricks because it is so universal. You can do so many crazy things with it. But maybe it's not your speed. Another thing you can try is you can try candles or a campfire. Just, you know, be careful because it is a campfire. So <laughs> fire safety is important. Um, and then I, you, you could use LED strips, lava lamps, flashlights, glow stick. The list can go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I would really encourage you to look out for something. If it emits light, see if maybe there's a way that you can use it to light a photograph. Some things out there just won't work out. Like, uh, I know one time I tried to use the light that came off of the, uh, the light that came out of my, uh, the, the little monitor on a microwave. I tried that once, didn't work out. Well, live and learn. <laughs> um, but you know, sometimes you might be lucky. Maybe your microwave can. Who knows? <laughs> so uh, before we uh, uh, can wrap things up here and I present you with your challenge, that's right, I have a challenge for everybody this evening. I'm gonna go ahead and ask if we've got any questions. Uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I have a challenge for you, and I'm sure every single one of you is up to the task. I know you can do it. But uh, in the meantime, if you've got any questions, uh, seriously, throw them our way. Let's see if I can uh, help you out with this, with anything, sorry. And uh, if you want me to re-go over anything or uh, retouch on some things, I would be more than happy to do that for you. I know I was going a little fast there, but uh, I would be it would be my pleasure to re-go over some things there. Okay, I have, I think I've got two here. Oh, no, I've got quite a few coming in. All right, so I see Lorraine's question. We've got, are you going to do a class on filters? 
I have not currently planned a class for filters, but I will keep that in mind for something to maybe do in the future. Uh, thank you so much for the recommendation, actually. That's, that's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, Velma would like to know, okay, so we're going to be posting this video uh, on our YouTube on our YouTube channel. So if you go to uh, YouTube and look up Do Space, you can find our channel and that's where we're gonna go ahead and uh, have these things posted. That's, we post actually uh, every webinar that we hold, actually. So if there's ever a webinar that you missed or uh, didn't quite make it to, or maybe you couldn't quite connect, uh, you can rest assured that it will always be uh, on the YouTube channel. I say maybe after, uh, give or take a few days. And we've got, an, I've got another one here from this, uh, from, I apologize if I butcher this, uh, Ren, Rene, Rene? Uh, any way to increase the light exposure with an iPhone camera when outside? Yes. Okay. So, um, this is going to get into the more pro or not pro, uh, the advanced settings on your iPhone camera. Um, if you mess around with the aperture, settings there, if you increase the aperture, it's going to allow more light to get in. And that will lead to brighter photos, but also sometimes it won't balance things out and will look too, it'll look sort of washed out sort of. So you gotta be careful when doing that. Um, that would, that'd be one way to go about uh, getting better light exposure with your, uh, with your iPhone there. Okay, I think, uh, We'll wait a moment more to see if we've got any more questions. Uh, I do see we have quite a few folks in here tonight, so if you have something that you're curious about, seriously, feel free to jump in there. Oh, uh, your iPhone does not have an aperture setting, or I can't find it. Okay, so uh, I'm not too familiar with the iPhone. I'm more of an Android user, but uh, I believe you have to switch the camera mode to, I think it's called Pro. Uh, I think it's pro or advanced or something like that. Um, using that will allow you to have a lot more settings you can change, but you'll, you'll have to move it off the, the basic camera mode um, to get to that, those sort of settings. No problem. Okay, doke. So I, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and conclude this here and I'm gonna go ahead and give you your challenge. And so here it is. I challenge you to go out there and use what you've learned. Um, we would love to see the results of what you've learned from this evening. If you go ahead and post that on Facebook, uh, just uh, just put the picture up there, maybe add a description and just say at do space. We'll go ahead and see that. Um, we would love to see, I personally would love to see what you folks do with all of this. Um, uh, if you don't get it right on the first few tries or like maybe you don't think your pictures are worthy, that's okay. You don't, you don't like the way things are turning out. That's fine. You just got to keep trying. Um, but yeah, I, I guarantee you if you, uh, if you use the rule of thirds and maybe try a few lighting patterns here and there, you're going to see some seriously awesome results, some serious uh, improvements, shall we say. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, if you do have any questions, by the way, if you have questions later, feel free to throw those to us uh, at hello at dospace.org. Or you can always visit us on our website and use our live chat. We're uh, always, or at least within hours, we're always available to uh, answer questions there as well. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. It has been a pleasure and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody. All right. You have a nice evening, everyone. Take care. See you in the next one.